Welcome. And uh, Rupert is here to give three days of teaching on our course at Schumacher called Mind in Nature. Is, is nature totally mechanical or is mind suffused throughout nature? I think you pro can probably guess the answer. <laughs> and, at least our answer. And Rupert has been coming to the college from the very beginning. We were just talking about when his first visit was with his young family in May 1991. And he's been supporting the college ever since, coming to teach on short courses and then on our MSc in Holistic Science. We have many of our MSc students on his course and also our MA students. So it's wonderful to welcome Rupert again. I'll just say a little bit about him. You probably know about him. But I think he's one of the most important scientists of our time. He's a great intellect and hugely intuitive and incredibly courageous. He's taking on the mainstream, showing convincingly, I think, using good experiment and scientific data that telepathy really exists, that there are morphic fields, that there's mind in nature, and many, many more things. He started his scientific life at Cambridge, where uh, he, was a, he was a biologist um, for Clare College, and spent a lot of time connected with Cambridge University. He's written about 80 technical papers, 10 books, and he's a fantastic speaker. So thank you for coming to this event, and you're going to have a wonderful time with Rupert. Welcome, Rupert. Thanks, and it's very good to be here again. The science delusion is the belief that Science already understands the nature of reality in principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. Um, basically, we've got it all figured out. And I think this is a terrible delusion. I think it's inhibiting scientific inquiry. Um, it's causing the sciences to undergo a law of diminishing return. Ever-increasingly expensive research is yielding fewer and fewer true discoveries and breakthroughs. It's something that's worrying a lot of people within the science establishment. And I think that part of the root of this is, is this uh, dogmatic belief system which has taken over science. In the heart of science, there's a conflict between science as a method of inquiry, open-minded uh, investigation of nature, hypothesis, experimental evidence, open debate, self-correcting, all that kind of thing, which many people think of as the way science is. It's actually a kind of ideal of the way science should be or ought to be, and it's an ideal which I share. Uh, but in reality, uh, things are very different. And one of the reasons they're different is that for many people, science has become not just a method of inquiry, but a world view. The kind of people who say, I don't believe in God, I believe in science, are people who've adopted the so-called scientific world view um, and made that their basis of uh, belief and understanding reality. And science is not meant to be a world view. Uh, what's actually happened is that uh, the sciences have been taken over by the materialist philosophy of nature. This takeover occurred in the 19th century, towards the end of the 19th century. And now the sciences are wholly owned subsidiaries of materialism, uh, which is a philosophy of nature. Now, you can defend it as a philosophy, uh, but it's not science. It's an overarching framework within which science is currently done. It's a paradigm, a model of reality. It consists of uh, ten distinct dogmas, and these dogmas are usually taken for granted by people um, uh, who believe them without realizing they're actually believing something. Most people who believe these dogmas simply think they're the truth. Um, and this makes them different from religious beliefs. People who have religious beliefs know they have a belief. People who have scientific beliefs don't know they have a belief. They just think they know the truth. And uh, this underlies some of this strident fundamentalism that we've been had a lot of, a scientific fundamentalism, uh, that's become coupled to militant atheism in recent years. Um, what I do in my book, The Science Delusion, is take the ten dogmas of science, and I turn them into questions, and look at them scientifically, see how well they stack up. If you examine them in the light of the evidence uh, and think about them rationally, instead of taking them for granted. Most scientists take them for granted, not because they've thought about them, but because they haven't. And uh, 
That's why it's important to bring them out into the light so you can actually see what these assumptions are and see how valid they are. It turns out that they're not valid, uh, that uh, every one of them, when it's turned into a question, opens up completely new ways of looking at the world, uh, which I think could lead to a renaissance in science. Uh, I'm very pro-science, not anti-science. Um, but I think science is not realising anything like its full potential under its pe present system, stultified by dogma, uh, 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 imprisoned within rigid institutional frameworks, and dominated by uh, fear. Most scientists think much more freely in private than they will do in public, because basically they're afraid of stepping out of line. Well, what are these ten dogmas? I'll just run through them briefly, and then I'll examine two or three of them in more detail. I don't have time to look at all ten this evening. First and foremost is the dogma that nature is mechanical or machine-like. And this became the dominant theme in science right at the beginning of modern science in the 17th century. It put all of science uh, on the basis of a machine metaphor. The reason this is important is that before that, in the Middle Ages, uh, in all the European universities, including our English universities of Oxford and Cambridge, um, the view of nature was that, uh, that was taught everywhere was that nature is organic. The earth is alive. Animals and plants are truly alive. They're living beings. Animals are beings with souls. That's where, by the word animal, from the Latin anima, uh, that's where the word comes from. Um, and they have their own internal purposes, their own goals, and they're self-organizing. Now, by contrast, a machine has no purposes of its own. It doesn't organize itself. That's why it has to be designed by an external designer, a human designer, and made in a factory. Um, so machines are not self-organizing and don't have their own purposes. Um, and that's what makes them different. And in the 17th century, people thought, well, God's the machine maker and designer, uh, uh, like an engineer, a mathematical engineer and creates everything in nature, but nothing has its own purpose. Nothing in nature has any purpose. That was why this was a radical break with the view of nature that went before, uh, which was an animistic view of nature. Uh, there was a living God of a living world. Uh, then there was a kind of, after the 17th century, a mechanical God of a mechanical world. The second dogma is that matter is unconscious. This world machinery is made out of totally unconscious matter. The entire universe, the stars, the planets, uh, everything is unconscious matter. Um, everything uh, that's made out of ma matter I I is unconscious. Um, the only exception uh, are human minds, and I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, third, the laws of nature are fixed. The laws and the constants of nature have been the same ever since the Big Bang, and they will be the same forever. Fourth, the total amount of matter and energy is always the same. Uh, all the matter and the energy in the universe came into being suddenly in the Big Bang, uh, and it's remained the same in quantity ever since, governed by the same laws. As my friend Terence McKenna used to say, a modern science is based on the principle of give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. And the one free miracle is the appearance of all the matter and energy in the universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. Um, fifth, nature is purposeless. There are no purposes in nature. Teleology, the subject of the study of purpose, is the ultimate taboo uh, within science. Um, evolution has no purpose or direction. We got here just by blind chance and the laws of nature. There's no purpose, there's no overriding goal in anything. Uh, our lives are led in a purposeless universe that's going nowhere. Sixth, biological inheritance is material. Everything that we inherit, everything that any organism inherits, uh, is inherited materially as genes, the DNA of the genes, as uh, epigenetic modifications, chemical modifications of the genes, and a cytoplasmic inheritance. Uh, so it's all inherited materially. Seven, uh, memories are stored as material traces inside your brain. Everything that you or any other animal remembers is stored physically, materially, inside your head. Everything you remember about your childhood, where you went on holiday last year, what you had for breakfast this morning, all the skills you've acquired, like riding bicycles, driving cars, and so forth, 
bowling in cricket or whatever. Um, all these skills, uh, every, every kind of memory is encased inside the brain in some kind of material trace, a memory trace either through phosphorylated proteins or modified nerve endings, but it's material. All memory is material. It's taken for granted uh, within the neurosciences and indeed by most people outside science. Most people have bought into this assumption without realizing it. Um, most people assume memory must be in the brain. Where else would it be? Um, uh, dogma uh, eight is the mind is inside the brain. Mental activity is brain activity. Your mind is inside your head. All your subjective experience is going on inside your skull. Dogma 9 follows from Dogma 8, uh, and it's the belief that psychic phenomena are illusory. They can't really happen because thoughts and intentions can't have an effect at a distance because they're all inside the head. Therefore, any evidence for psychic phenomena has to be dismissed, denied, or or trashed in some way, uh, just brushed aside as being flawed or fraudulent or illusory, uh, because they can't, these things can't really happen. And people who believe this uh, are extremely impatient with any evidence for psychic phenomena. They don't want to waste time looking at this, because they know in advance it's all false, because it can't possibly be true. And finally, the dogma 10 is that mechanistic medicine is the only kind that really works. Alternative and complementary medicines may appear to work, but that's only because people would have got better anyway, or because of the placebo effect. Um, the only kind that really works is mechanistic medicine, and that's why the Medical Research Council spends its budget of hundreds of millions of pounds a year, taxpayers' money, exclusively on mechanistic medical research. It's why uh, health services and mainstream insurance companies around the world only fund conventional medicine because it's the only kind that really works. So these are the ten basic dogmas and they, they taken together this, this constitutes the kind of default intellectual position of educated people in the world today. Most educated people have been educated to think this is the modern scientific world view and the successes of science appear to make it unquestionable. Uh, the successes of jet planes, the internet, uh, mobile phones and so forth uh, seem to show that the whole of this worldview must be true. It works in this most incredible way. Um, um, but uh, of course the successes of these technologies don't prove that this underlying philosophy of nature is true. But most people assume it is and this worldview is now the default worldview of all educated people in the West but we've now e exported this uh, view of nature so that all young Chinese, Indians, South Americans, Africans, Arabs are all being brought up with this world view. This is what we're teaching them in schools. That's what education is all about, converting people to this view of the world. Nature is essentially dead and inanimate and um, uh, the role of human activity in economies is to cre create increasing wealth, expanding economies uh, through science and technology. This is the default position of every government in the world, I would say, with the possible exception of Bhutan. Uh, but um, the, even they are really into engineering and hydroelectric schemes in, in a fairly benign way. Okay, so I'm just going to take uh, two or three of these uh, dogmas. I'll start with matter and energy. This is the one I questioned least myself. I'd always taken this one for granted. Um, <clears throat> and although I questioned all the other dogmas over the years, this is the only one I hadn't actually thought about until I came to write this book. I thought I should include it because it's definitely one of the primary assumptions. Um, and I rather hoped that I'd find it held up to critical scrutiny. Uh, to have a book where all ten dogmas are false, I thought might uh, turn, seem a bit biased. So I actually quite wanted uh, the conservation of matter and energy to be valid. But as soon as I looked at it, the whole thing fell apart, and it's actually one of the most questionable of them all. Um, <clears throat> first of all, you have to look at the history. How did people come to believe uh, this? Was it because they had unbelievably uh, accurate measurements and very, very careful research? Well, no, that's not how it came about at all. In ancient Greece, uh, the roots of this worldview of materialism were put forward by the atomist philosophers. And in ancient Greece, the different schools of philosophy were grappling 
with an assumption that they all made, which is that reality is eternal. The ultimate reality is changeless, timeless, and eternal. That was the starting point for most Greek philosophy. They probably arrived at this idea from mystical experience, because many mystics then and now have the experience of going to an ultimately real realm where there is no time. But they tried to turn it into a philosophy. The Pythagoreans thought the eternal reality was mathematical, um, <clears throat> and that was the underlying basis of everything beyond space and time eternal maths. Plato, influenced by the Pythagoreans, had the idea of an eternal world of forms or ideas. The archetypes of everything in nature exist beyond nature in an, in an archetypal transcendent world. The atomists were against Plato and the Pythagoreans, and they said, no, eternal reality is matter, and matter is made of lots of little bits, the atoms, which by definition can't be broken up or split. Uh, and therefore the total amount persists indefinitely, forever. Um, in other words, the total amount of matter is always the same. The atoms can't be destroyed by definition. In the 17th century, the foundations of modern science were established uh, by reviving atomism and Platonism or Pythagoreanism. The assumption was that the laws of nature are eternal mathematical ideas in the mind of a mathematical god. So when Newton discovered his law of gravitation, it wasn't just a temporary hypothesis, it was an insight into the divine mind. That's why science acquired such huge prestige. It became a new priesthood, because scientists could rise above the conflicts of religion. And in the 17th century, Protestants and Catholics were killing each other all over Europe in the Thirty Years' War. Um, uh, and the idea was that science would rise above this sectarian conflict to absolute truth, the absolute knowledge of God's most intimate inner nature, which was mathematical. And so these eternal mathematical ideas, of, uh, laws of nature, were eternal ideas in the mind of God. And these laws governed eternal atoms of matter that were created by God in the first place at the creation of the world machine, uh, but which remained the same thereafter. And when God started the world machine in motion at the beginning, uh, he impelled it with, uh, with a certain amount of movement or energy or force. And that amount remained the same forever because it was God given. Now that's the root of the present principle of conservation of matter and energy, a kind of theological uh, interpretation of Platonism and Pythagoreanism and materialism in the 17th century. In the 19th century, uh, these so-called laws were codified uh, more rigorously uh, in the principles of conservation of matter and energy. Uh, the principle of conservation of energy was the first law of thermodynamics, 1851. Um, so they, they, became, they took on a more definite and better defined form in the 19th century. But the assumption that they're true was already taken for granted. No one did experiments to find out, are they true? Could they be false? No, this was already taken for granted. Now, most of us think this is so true, so unquestionable, that there's nothing we can do about it. Um, we just have to accept it. Physicists... Uh, uh, much freer. They're, they're in a sense above the laws of nature because they make them. And so um, they, they uh, have never felt the same constraint. In the 1980s, uh, this became clear with uh, the discovery that within the galaxies, um, stars were moving too fast around the galactic centre and galaxies were attracting each other too much to be explained by the amount of matter within them. People added up the amount of matter in gas clouds and the stars, and assuming there were planets and black holes as well, add all that up, and there's not enough matter in the galaxies to explain the way they attract each other or the way the stars behave within them. So either this understanding of galaxies is false, or there must be a lot more matter than we can account for, we, than we can see. So rather than revise the whole theory of galaxies, uh, they took the easier option, which is to say, well, there must be a whole lot of matter there that uh, we don't know about in any normal way, and this is called dark matter, because you can't see it. Now, how much dark matter is there? Well, that's simple. You just 
work out the equations. How much do you need to explain the phenomena? You titrate in exactly that amount of dark matter, and that's how much there is. Since it can't be observed in any other way, and there's no other evidence for its existence, you can have as much or as little as you like. And you can adjust the equations continually, as they are doing. If a, if a galaxy has an unusual bulge, it ought, it ought not to have. You add in dark matter to explain the bulge. It's a perfect theory uh, from the point of view of physics. It explains all the facts, and you can adjust it at will. The only trouble is there's no independent evidence for dark matter. Um, there's no... Uh, observations. No one has a clue what it is. There are endless debates within physics about it. But these um, <clears throat> are rather academic debates since there are no observational data except for the fact that galaxies and things don't behave as they ought to if there was just ordinary matter. So um, this then created a further problem. There's about five times more dark matter than regular matter uh, according to these theories. So having added all this extra matter into the universe, it meant its gravitational pull should be greater than people previously thought. As the universe expands, it's being pulled back in by gravitation. And if you suddenly have a lot more gravitation in the universe, it should be slowing down the universal expansion until it stops expanding and then begins to contract. Um, in the 1980s, uh, people thought this is what would happen. They thought that the universe would stop expanding and then begin to contract, and it would contract faster and faster until it ended in the reverse of the Big Bang, known in the trade as the Big Crunch. Um, then some people said, well, if there's a Big Crunch, it could be the Big Bang of the next universe. And so they, you, then they created the bouncing universe model. Um, well, so... Uh, that, see, that was the dominant theory for quite a while, but then in the late 1990s, people discovered that the outermost galaxies and quasars in the universe are not slowing down. Uh, the expansion of the universe seems to be speeding up. Uh, things are moving apart faster and faster, the exact opposite of what the theory had predicted. So how can you explain that? Well, quite simple. There must be another kind of energy no one knew about before, dark energy, uh, which it explains the expansion of the universe and counteracts the effects of dark matter. How much is there? Well, just the right amount to explain the observed phenomena. And this amount changes as people adjust the equations from year to year. Uh, you can sliding scale of this at just as much or as little as you like. Um, the total amount of dark matter and energy is currently estimated to be uh, more than 96% of reality. The kind of matter and energy you learned about in school uh, is less than 4% of what's actually there. And the laws of conservation of matter and energy you learned about apply to that 4%. Do they apply to the rest? Well, no one has a clue. In fact, um, current theories of dark matter uh, say that the uh, total amount of dark matter in the universe uh, sorry, dark energy is actually increasing. As the universe expands, it makes more dark energy. So the universe is now a perpetual motion machine. So how seriously can we take these laws? Uh, then within quantum physics, there's another mysterious kind of energy called zero-point energy. It's in what's called the quantum vacuum field. Um, Physics explains the quantum vacuum field as being necessary to explain all interactions between light and matter, and uh, something that's necessary to explain all electromagnetic forces as well. That there's this sea of energy called the quantum vacuum field, which is full, not empty. Uh, the matter we know about are like waves on an ocean, a deep ocean of energy. There's enough energy in the quantum vacuum field in its teaspoon to power Britain for decades. Uh, there's so much energy in this quantum vacuum field, according to the theories of physics. Uh, according to the theories of physics, as you sit on your seat right now, the reason you don't go through it is because your bottom is repelled by the seat through an electromagnetic effect. It's uh, basically an electrical repulsion that stops you going through the seat. And that is mediated by virtual photons generated from the quantum vacuum field. Underneath every one of your bottoms, there's a vast a glistening ocean of virtual photons that stops you falling through the seat. And as soon as you stand up, those stop being generated, and now you get many more underneath your feet, where there's more weight and more repulsion involved in stopping you going through the floor. This is standard physics uh, today. Um, and uh, the, the um, quantum vacuum field uh, is, has all this energy in it. So not surprisingly, some people say, well, could we tap it? 
There are people who claim to have made machines that do tap it. Um, they're usually called above unity devices or free energy machines because they uh, give out more energy than you put in. Now, as soon as anyone comes up with these machines, they're immediately subject to the oldest taboo in science, started by Galileo, a prohibition against perpetual motion machines. And the law of conservation of matter and energy and the laws of thermodynamics prohibit such machines. So people have invented them. You can read about them on the internet. They have them in, some of them people have them in garages, some have small companies where they make them. But as soon as they go to any of the major investors or governments, uh, the governments sort of ring up their physics advisor and say, we've got a chap here who's you know, got this machine. It seems to give out more energy than you put in. Couldn't this be jolly useful? And, and, and uh, so they ring up the physics advisor, and the physics advisor says to them, absolute rubbish. These people are cranks. It's impossible. It can't exist. It's a perpetual motion machine. Uh, don't touch it with a barge pole. So they don't. But what if some of these machines actually work? They would completely transform the world economy, obviously, if there were sources of energy vastly greater than anything we can get from sh shale gas or, uh, or uh, tar sands or coal, um, or even wind. And, and uh, this, these, these could be completely transformative technologies. So do these machines work? Their proponents say they do. Sometimes they give demonstrations. They have them tested. Um, and they seem some of them stand up to fairly rigorous testing. But do they work? Don't they work? No one knows. At least I don't know. I'd love to know. Um, my solution here would be to set up a $1 million uh, prize for the best uh, above unity device and have an international contest and see if any of them really work under fair testing conditions. There are laboratories in America that are equipped to do this kind of testing, probably some here as well. Um, and the, they could be tested fairly by qualified engineers and physicists who are not trying to debunk it, but to see if any of them are real. If any of them are real, they'd win the prize. If not several of them are real, then the one that produces the most energy would win the prize. If none of them are real, none of them will win the prize. And um, if I were setting this up, I would not only have the prize, I'd, I'd persuade... Uh, bookmakers like Little Woods to open a book on this, and so that people who say it's totally impossible, it can't ever happen, say, okay, well, you can put your money where your mouth is. How much are you prepared to bet that no one will win this prize? And then people who think it might happen, how much are you prepared to bet it might happen? I'd be prepared to bet about a thousand pounds it might happen. Um, so I think this would be actually really exciting science. There'd be a book on this, there'd be people making bets, there'd be a prize, the finals could be on television. Um, I think it could bring this whole subject out of the shadows where it's been stuck for decades because of this taboo, and we'll find out if something really happens. Uh, if none of these devices really work, then the people who've uh, been saying it's all rubbish all this time would have the sweet pleasure of saying, I told you so, um, also winning their bets. Um, and they ought to be grateful because this would actually move the cause of science forward, whereas denial, ridicule and uh, rejection of these phenomena, uh, of these devices, doesn't move science forward. It's just an expression of dogma and taboo. Um, well, this is one area where I think things could change and they could have huge effects. Now, I just want to turn now to the idea of the laws and constants of nature are fixed. Um, this is another of these dogmatic assumptions. Now, this is one I've personally been questioning for years. Um, I think the idea of fixed laws of nature doesn't really make much sense in a radically evolutionary universe. In the 17th century, the idea was that, that nature is eternal once God's created it in the first place, and um, it has eternal laws and eternal matter. In the 18th century, at the end of the 18th century, French rationalist physicists like Laplace uh, thought they could get rid of God uh, or any need for God by saying the universe was eternal. Eternal matter and energy governed by eternal laws with no beginning. Well, that made sense in, in its own terms. But then along comes the Big Bang Theory, which became orthodox in physics in 1966, which says the universe began about 14 billion years ago, uh, very small and very hot, less than the size of the head of a pin, and it's been expanding and cooling ever since. Now, where were, where all the, were the laws of nature all there at the moment of the Big Bang? 
did they suddenly spring uh, from nowhere like a Napoleonic code uh, for the new universe? Um, or were they there before the universe? Were they truly eternal? Well, these are metaphysical questions. You couldn't possibly test them experimentally. But most scientists assumed they were all there at the moment of the Big Bang. So the universe evolves, but the laws are fixed. Why are they fixed? Well, because people always used to think they were fixed, and it's a habit of thinking. Uh, but in an evolving universe, why shouldn't the laws evolve? In fact, why should they be laws at all? As soon as you begin to think about it, the whole concept falls apart. Um, laws are, occur only in human societies, only in civilised human societies. Uh, they don't occur in nature. It's an anthropocentric metaphor projected onto the whole of nature, um, which is actually quite inappropriate. Um, as C.S. Lewis once said, to say that a stone falls to earth because it's obeying a law makes it a man and even a citizen. Um, so it's a very inappropriate metaphor, and I think a better one is habit. I think that the universe evolves, and as it evolves, habits develop, and through repetition become more habitual. And I think the regularities of nature are essentially habits. This idea was first put forward uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, one of the philosophers who put it forward was C.S. Peirce, the American philosopher. Um, my own development of the habit theory is based on my theory of morphic resonance, which says that there's a memory in every kind of thing in nature given by a resonance across time and space between similar things. Um, it means that each kind of thing has a collective memory. Giraffes have a collective giraffe memory. As a giraffe embryo grows, it's influenced by the shape of previous giraffe embryos by morphic resonance. As it starts behaving, it inherits the instincts, the habits of the species by morphic resonance. They're not in the genes. Uh, most of the uh, genes, in fact, uh, don't code for behavior and form. They code for the structure of proteins. That's what we know they do. Um, this theory makes predictions. Uh, for example, if you train rats to learn a new trick in one place, rats all over the world will learn the same thing quicker just because the rats have learned it in the first place without any other known means of connection. And there's already evidence this actually happens. But I'm not here this evening to talk about my own particular theory of morphic resonance. I'm only mentioning it in passing. I'm going to be talking about it tomorrow to those who are on the MSC, call, uh, on the workshop, the Mind and Nature uh, uh, um, uh, program. Um, so that's not my main focus this evening. If you want to read more about it, then uh, it's explained in detail in my book, The Presence of the Past, Morphic Resonance and the Habits of Nature. It's also summarized in The Science Delusion. But uh, what I'll do now is turn, uh, because I don't want to focus just on my own ideas, uh, turn to the constants of nature, um, because this is again something that uh, is assumed to be constant, not just laws, but constants. The so-called fundamental constants are measured quantities uh, which are supposed to regulate the way nature works. Uh, the two best known are the universal gravitational constant, or Newton's constant, constant often known as big G, because it's written with a capital G, um, and the speed of light, C. Um, both of these are among the seven or eight fundamental constants that are believed to be utterly constant, utterly fundamental. Well, do they vary? Is this just an assumption? Well, the answer is it is just an assumption. It's part of the laws and constants being the same forever assumption. Uh, but what are the data? When I got interested in this, um, I s actually looked to see if the data had changed. Um, uh, there are books you find in science libraries called Handbooks of Physical Constants. And uh, I think the main one, the, the um, CRC Handbook of Physical Constants, is now in about the 43rd edition. Um, so uh, they have many numerous editions, and what I did is I got out the old editions from the Patent Office Library in London. I got them retrieved from the uh, reserve stock room. They wheeled on a dust covered tro trolley of dust covered volumes, and I was able to look at the constants over the years. When I did that, I found to my astonishment that the speed of light had dropped uh, between 1928 and 1945 by 20 kilometers per second. It's defined to so and so many kilometers per second and then three or four decimal places. So if it had dropped by 20 kilometers per second, this is huge, uh, a, a huge change. 
And I looked up the primary literature of the period, and I found during that period, all around the world, people were getting this low value. And then it went up again. Uh, they all started getting a new value. And I thought, that's really, really interesting. Uh, that would have huge implications. Maybe the speed of light is cyclic. Maybe this would affect the whole the way the universe develops and works. But I couldn't find any physicist who explained. They didn't want to discuss it. They, most of them didn't know about it, because they just look at the latest value and assume that's true or as true as it could be. So I went to see the head of metrology, the science of measuring constants, at the National Physical Laboratory in Teddington. I asked him if I could visit him to discuss changes in the constants. And he was kind enough to see me, and he was very friendly. And I said to him, look, I've found that there's this, the, the speed of light seems to have dropped by 20 kilometers per second all over the world during this period. And I'd like to ask you about it. And he said, oh dear. He said, you've discovered the most embarrassing episode, uh, incident in the history of our science. And I said, well, don't you think it's rather exciting? I mean, what if the speed of light really changed in, in that period? Oh, he said, it couldn't have really changed. And I said, well, why not? He said, because it's a constant. <laughs> and, um, so I said, well, then how do you explain it? People all over the world getting this value that was much lower than the values before and afterwards. I, mean, I said, I can't think of it. If it's not a real change, what could it be? It must be some kind of collective delusion. And I said, this must have been brought about by people uh, correcting their results and fudging their results till they got what they thought everyone else was getting all around the world. And he said, well, he said, we don't like to use the word fudge. <laughs> and so I said, well, what do you prefer? He said, we prefer the phrase intellectual phase locking. <laughs> so I said, you mean to say that all around the world people were correcting their values to this wildly different value just because other people were coming up with values that were all in the very same uh, bracket and then the fashion changed and they intellectually phase locked into a different value. I said, how do we know that's not going on today? He said, oh, we can be very sure of that. And I said, why? He said, well, we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. He said, it can never happen again. And, uh, so I said, well, what if it really did change? I mean, he said, oh, we'd never know it. And I said, why not? He said, we'd define the meter in terms of the speed of light. He said, that had changed too. He said, the whole thing's completely watertight now. And, uh, so well, I thought, that's impressive. They've managed to fix that problem. Um, but... Um, um, then I said, well, what about the gravitational constant, uh, the universal gravitational constant? He said, well, it's a bit trickier. Um, he said, that has been varying rather a lot. Um, <laughs> and in fact, even in the last 10 years, it's varied by more than 1.3%. That's a lot if something's defined to many places of decimals. Um, in fact, recent variations have been about 100, 200 times more than the supposed error limits, that, you know, the plus or minus, the error thing that they give, the standard deviation. Uh, huge changes in the gravitational constant in different labs around the world. What happens at the moment is that they, labs measure it, it comes out with different values on different days, then they average it. Then the British National Physical Lab, the American Bureau of Standards, the French Central Laboratory of Physics, they all send in their values to the International Committee on Metrology. And uh, they then average the ones from different labs and come up with the latest best value of the gravitational constant. So um, I said to Dr. Petley, well, what if, say, there was, as the Earth moves, the solar system moves through the galaxy, what if there are actual fluctuations in G because of the Earth's environment? You know, clouds of dark matter that the Earth goes through or changes in relation to the rest of the galaxy. Um, what if these errors are correlated? What if they're all high on one day in one lab and low in another? Um, th there might be a reason for these big variations. He said, oh, no, no, they're constant. He said, no point looking for fluctuations. They're just errors. So... Uh, I, for the last 10 years, I've been trying to persuade metrologists to put their raw data online uh, with the dates and the values, and then have an exercise in open science so anyone could look for patterns. Do they go up and go down together? Do they fluctuate? Uh, there's already some evidence they fluctuate on a daily and annual basis, uh, but they may fluctuate on another basis as well that no one's yet discovered. If we looked at their data we'd find out something new, something really interesting that would make the universe seem much more alive instead of just having these fixed, flat value of the constants. But 
the metrologists will not look at the data because they know it's a constant. And here's a very other trivial example. It's a big subject, but I mean, it's an example where dogma is seriously impeding scientific research. And this research would cost almost nothing. I'm trying to persuade them at the moment to put them online. I'm having another go at this. And I did meet a metrologist earlier this month who was got, got very interested in this and, and said he'd try and talk to his colleagues. And so there's some hope this could happen. Anyway, when I left the um, head of metrology at the National Physical Lab, he reached down to a cardboard box beside his desk and he said, oh, by the way, you might want one of these. They've just come from the printers. He pulled out a pamphlet and he handed it to me. He said, the latest values of the physical constants. Um, well, um, I think it's quite feasible that the constants fluctuate. They may fluctuate within narrow limits. I think the day may come when in scientific journals like Nature, uh, a bit like newspaper stock market reports, there's, you know, this week's value of the constants. G held firm this week, the charge on the electron was up, uh, so there was a fall in the fine structure constant. You know, and, and, um, if the constants actually fluctuated, then you know, there'd be different qualities of time. Different things could happen at different times. Nature would be kind of pulsing with these different fluctuations, which wouldn't necessarily all be in phase with each other. Um, and why not? I, I think that's quite likely to happen. What's stopping us finding that out at the moment is this dogmatic assumption. Now, <clears throat> let me turn finally to the assumption that matter is unconscious. This assumption dates back to the 17th century. When René Descartes, the philosopher of the world machine, he's the person who most clearly formulated the machine theory of nature, um, uh, when he formulated his view, he made a sharp distinction between matter, which he defined as unconscious, and mind, which is consciousness. And Descartes said that all of the matter in the universe is unconscious. It's just stuff that's pushed around by external forces. Animals are just machines, plants are just machines, human bodies are just machines. But there's one exception in all of nature to everything being unconscious matter, and that's conscious human minds, which are totally different from unconscious matter. They're not in space and time, and they're immaterial. We alone have them in the natural world, and the only other beings with immaterial minds are angels and God. So humans, human minds, angels and God are immaterial. Everything else is material. Now, he couldn't explain how these minds interacted with the brain. He thought it happened in the pineal gland. And modern dualistic theories are similar, except the supposed seat of interaction has shifted a couple of inches into the cerebral hemispheres. Um, but uh, this was Descartes' theory, and it created a sharp dualism between mind and body, between humans and other animals and the rest of nature, because we, we have conscious minds and purposes, and they don't. Therefore, we can use them in factory farms, vivisection, do what we like, because they're just in sentient automata. Um, <clears throat> and it also created a split between science and religion. Religion got human minds, angels, and God. Science got the entire physical universe. Um, and by having this division of labor, it avoided conflicts for much of the history of science. They were these two separate compartments of activity, kept apart and out of conflict. Now, <clears throat> this is called Cartesian dualism. And many people have found it unsatisfactory. Most people who find it unsatisfactory think that two is too many. You should have ultimately just one explanatory principle. I myself am a Trinitarian. I think two is too few. Uh, I think we need three basic explanatory principles. But I won't go into my own theory this evening. Uh, I'll just deal with the history of trying to get rid of two and get down to one. If you start with a Cartesian dualism, you can get to one basic principle in, one, in two ways. Either you can say everything is mind, that's idealism, the philosophy of idealism. Consciousness is the only reality. Matter's a kind of dulled down, uh, repetitive consciousness. Um, or you can go in the other direction, materialism, and say the only reality is matter. Uh, mind has no independent existence. The only reality in the world is matter. And that materialist philosophy is what came to dominate science by the late 19th century. It started with Descartes' assumption that matter is unconscious. Then it rubbed out consciousness in human brains. Everything else in nature remained the same. Um, and uh, so 
it didn't, there wasn't any attempt to find out if animals are conscious or to investigate whether nature is conscious. It was assumed from the outset as a matter of definition by a French philosopher in the 17th century. And, and that's what lies behind modern materialism. Not experiments, not evidence, not serious discussion, simply a definition and a habit of thinking. Now, one of the first problems that this philosophy creates is the explanation of human consciousness. How come we are conscious if matter is unconscious and our brains are nothing but matter? Well, the answer is there is no explanation. We ought not to be conscious. And a lot of effort in 20th century philosophy of mind, and indeed psychology, was devoted to trying to prove that we're not conscious. Um, that consciousness is a kind of illusion. The dominant school of psychology in academic circles in the 20th century uh, was behaviorism, which says that the only scientific thing to study is uh, muscular contractions and glandular secretions. So behaviorists should study behavior and not get involved uh, with speculations about meaningless concepts like consciousness. So consciousness was driven out of mainstream psychology in the West for decades. Philosophers of mind in the West have mainly tried to prove that consciousness either doesn't exist, uh, it's just folk psychology to pretend it does, but really the only reality is neurophysiology, the behavior of nerves, or else that it's an illusion produced by the brain and it, that it does nothing. Uh, the problem with the illusion theory, which is probably the dominant one at the moment in academic circles, is that it doesn't explain consciousness, it presupposes it, because illusion is a mode of consciousness. These theories are so unsatisfactory that materialist philosophers spend their time shooting down their rivals' theories, putting up their own, which then get shot down, and all these theories seem terribly unconvincing. And the reason they seem unconvincing is because they are unconvincing. Um, and, and they've just gone round and round in circles. This is the basis of a huge industry. Most philosophers in the English-speaking world and almost all neuroscientists are materialists who deny consciousness or ignore it. However, interestingly, a few philosophers have recently broken ranks. The British materialist philosopher Galen Strawson wrote a key paper a few years ago called does materialism imply panpsychism? Panpsychism is the doctrine that there's a kind of element of psyche or mind in all matter, that it's not unconscious, there's a kind of proto-mind even in electrons. And he answered that question by saying yes. He said the only way that we can explain consciousness in brains uh, is by saying there's a capacity for mind or consciousness even in electrons and atoms and, and so on. More interestingly and more persuasively, uh, one of the leading American philosophers of mind, Thomas Nagel, came out with a book three months ago, uh, which I think is a very, very important milestone. It's called Mind and Cosmos. The subtitle is Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. And Nagel stirred up a firestorm in, in the American philosophical world. He's being denounced by angry materialists. And he himself is an atheist. It's not, it's not as if he's uh, somebody who's coming at this because he's a kind of creationist or something. He's an atheist philosopher who, in all honesty, just simply can't get along with this any longer. He thinks it's just ridiculous to pretend consciousness doesn't exist and that it just magically springs into being in human brains. Um, so this has triggered off a big debate, it's going on today, and materialism is weakening its hold over academic consciousness studies as we speak. Um, but of course, panpsychism is not a new theory. Um, in the 17th century, soon after Descartes' theory, uh, philosophers were trying to put forward better theories to avoid this extreme dualism. One of them was Leibniz, who said that every self-organizing system in nature, or monad, has both a body and a mind, and it re each monad reflects the whole universe from its own point of view. It was a universe of interconnected minds, all reflecting the universe from their own unique point of view. It's a fascinating theory. Spinoza, the Jewish philosopher in, um, in Amsterdam, uh, in Holland, uh, said that the whole of nature is like the body of God, and it's, there's a mind that goes with the whole of nature, and that's the mind of God. Panpsychism's had many supporters over the years, but my, in my view the most important and interesting was the 20th century British philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. 
Whitehead was a physicist and a, a, a mathematician. Um, he wrote Principia Mathematica with Bertrand Russell, uh, who was his student at Cambridge. Um, and um, he was one of the first philosophers to understand quantum physics when it came about in the 1920s. What he realized was that quantum physics tells us that electrons are wave waves, that the quant matter is made of waves, light's made of waves. Anything that's made of waves can't exist at an instant. A wave has to take time to wave, uh, and it takes space to wave as well. This is the ultimate reason why the, in quantum theory there's the uncertainty principle. You can't localize a, a wave at a particular point in time and space because it's a wave, it takes time. Matter is not stuff that persists. Matter is a process. That's what Whitehead told us. It's an ongoing process of wave-like activity. Because it's wave-like and because it's a process, it has a future pole and a past pole. A wave has a bit that's the leading edge and the trailing edge. Uh, it exists in time. It's spread out in time. And Whitehead's fascinating uh, take on the relation of mind and body was that the mental pole of all things, including electrons and humans, the mental pole is the future pole, the physical pole uh, is the past. So the relation of mind and body is a relation in time, not space. We normally think of the mind-body relationship as uh, 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 through spatial metaphors, the inner world, the outer world, uh, the inner life, the external world, that sort of thing, as if the mind's inside and the world's outside. He was saying it's not like that at all, it's a relation in time. Our minds, the mental aspect of us and of electrons, are concerned with possibilities. The mind is a realm of possibility, uh, and mental activity it consists in choosing among those possibilities. As soon as you made a choice among the many possibilities, it becomes a fact. I decide to raise my arm. As soon as I've decided to do that, out of all the possible things I could have done, I've done that. It's an objective fact. You can photograph it, measure it, detect it. It's a physical fact, but it's in the past. So um, the relation of mind and body is a fascinating idea of the, that the, the, the mind is concerned with virtual futures, things that haven't yet happened, with possibilities. And even in quantum theory, uh, the electron, the wave equation of the electron, uh, the Schrodinger wave equation it's called, uh, describes all the possible things an electron can do. Um, and the ele this gives you, a, 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 physics tells you possibilities or probabilities. When you measure the electron or when it interacts with something, all those possibilities collapse down to one observable fact, sometimes called the collapse of the wave function. Um, and it's as if even electrons are surrounded by a realm of possibility which can't be physical. Possibilities are not yet physical. As soon as one's chosen or happens by chance over and above the others, then it becomes a physical fact. But possibilities are not physical. And the mind is uh, in this realm of possibility. Well, I think that's a very fascinating aspect of um, Whitehead's philosophy. And the thing gets more fascinating if you actually think it through. Most of the discussions by Nagel and Strawson and Whitehead have been about electrons. The electrons are not very easy for us to imagine. But the same principles should apply to self-organizing physical systems that are large as well as ones that are small. And the one that I myself like thinking about most is the sun. The sun is a self-organizing system. Um, it has complex electromagnetic patterns of activity, uh, which we know more about now than ever before. But this raises the question of the sun's mind. Could the sun think? Could the sun have a mind as well as a body? Could it be thinking about future possibilities and making decisions among them, where to send out a solar flare, which direction a coronal mass ejection should go in? If, they if the sun points them towards the Earth, there'll be massive power outages and total chaos, and these things affect the climate as well, and the northern lights, and so on. Um, so, um, what if the sun thinks? Well, you may say that's a ridiculous idea, and every one of you will know that that's a prohibited thought. In the modern world, in the materialist world, where matter is unconscious, you cannot ask, does the sun think? That's a taboo subject, because it's off limits that matter is unconscious. Only stupid people would ask that. 
primitive people all around the world think the sun thinks. They think it's a god or a, it has a spirit in it. Um, the Greeks thought Apollo, the, the sun god, well, there was a kind of god of the sun. The Indians think there's a god of the sun, Surya. And um, uh, the children think the sun at least is, 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 thinks or at least is alive. When children under the age of about 10 draw the sun, they have a, a smiley face. The fact that children and primitive and traditional peoples think the sun thinks is, for many people in the modern world, sufficient evidence that this is a rubbish thought. It can't possibly think these people didn't know about modern science. But has modern science persuade, done experiments to find out that the sun's unconscious? No, it simply assumed that from the outset. It's simply an assumption. It's not something that's been thought out, argued about, discussed. It's just a taboo assumption, a dogmatic prohibition on thinking about it. Now, you may say to me, you can't prove the sun's conscious, and I can't. But if you say that to me, I'll say to you, well, you can't prove it's unconscious. This is an open question, and one which, in my mind, uh, is a valid part of scientific discovery. It so happens that almost the only attempt I've ever come across to uh, discuss the thought of the sun happened not very far from here, in Devon at Hazelwood. Um, I think it must have been about 12 years ago. Satish was there, and um, I think some of our friends from Hazelwood were there, uh, who are here this evening, I hope. Um, and we had a weekend over the summer solstice. We had a small invitational conference, uh, which we were discussing, Is the Sun Conscious? And uh, we got up at dawn on the summer solstice to see the sun rise over Dartmoor. And the rain clouds cleared just as the sun rose. And there was a full moon and there was a rainbow in the sky. It was a most wonderful event. Um, the first day we discussed whether we could, you know, what it would mean uh, for the sun to be conscious and could it ever be established. And the second day we moved on to, well, if the sun is conscious, what does it think about? And uh, one thing, of course, would be its body, the whole solar system. Um, and, uh, the, um, but, and then the other thing would be its peer group, the other stars. Um, so we, we, we had this conference right here in Devon. But as far as I know, this is the only time it's ever really been discussed. Um, inconclusive, of course. But it's a thought that I think it, it, it preoccupies me. I think about it quite a lot. Um, uh, because if the sun's conscious, the other stars would be conscious. And if they're conscious, what about entire galaxies? This is a level of organization above the stars. Maybe there's a vast galactic mind in each galaxy. There are huge pulses of electric current moving through the arms of the galaxies. Um, they, 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 it's like a living organism, a galaxy. The idea it's just propelled by gravity and dark matter is, I think, a very limited view of galaxies. These are like celestial living organisms. And the, the stars within them are like cells in the body of the galaxy. Um, and I think the whole galaxies might have thoughts. And clusters of galaxies might have thoughts. And then what about the entire cosmos? Uh, what about the universal cosmic fields of gravity, electromagnetism? Does the whole cosmos have a mind? Well, of course, this is something which traditional peoples have always believed. And uh, indeed, in medieval Europe, this was pretty well taken for granted. There's a kind of cosmic mind. But in materialist science, it's an unthinkable thought. It's just dead matter. Now, I don't think there's any reason why we have to stick to these dogmas of materialism. It's a worldview which has been useful for science. It's been uh, focused, a question, it focused attention on uh, material systems. Um, it's given us modern engineering and technology. Um, but it's basically outlived its usefulness. It's hopeless when it comes to understanding nature and the life of nature. It's hopeless when it comes to understanding minds and consciousness. It's not as if regular science has a brilliant theory about minds or human nature or how to live in this planet. It doesn't. It's a disastrous failure in many respects. It's very successful technologically. If you have a machine theory of nature, it's very good for building machines. Um, but it's not very good for understanding the, the very nature of nature, including our own nature, and indeed, those aspects of medicine, uh, which uh, depend not just on cells and molecules, but on minds. So these are just some of the ways in which the dogmas of science limit inquiry and research. In every area, when you look at these dogmas and you question them, whole new possibilities open up. The whole world could be quite different.
And I think that as this process happens, we'll undergo a kind of scientific renaissance. Science is stuck. Um, I was at a conference recently where some top American scientists were really worried about this. They said it's somehow it's stuck. There have been very few real breakthroughs for decades now. Um, same, same in medicine. There's a wonderful book by James Lefanu called The Rise and Fall of Modern Medicine. Almost all the great discoveries, you know, penicillin, heart transplants, um, and so on, were made up until the 1980s. The last really major one was the discovery that stomach ulcers are caused by a bacterium. But for 20 years or so, there's been no real breakthroughs. Genomics was supposed to revolutionize medicine, and it hasn't. The Genome Project has fizzled out in a whole series of embarrassing failures. Um, and um, the drug companies are falling off what's called the patents cliff. As the patents on old drugs run out, they've got very few new ones in the pipeline. The whole system's in crisis. It's increasingly expensive. It's not working. And it's based on a model of human nature which is extremely confined and constricted to this mechanistic model. In every, in every place we look, we see the possibility for real new breakthroughs in science, uh, uh, moving out of this old model into a new uh, paradigm. And that paradigm, in a nutshell, is of the world as alive, organic, and with a mind or a mental aspect to it. So I think we stand on the threshold of uh, a new scientific renaissance. But it's going to involve just a, not just a revolution in ideas, but a revolution in institutional arrangements, in science funding, and so on. And there's a tremendous institutional inertia. Um, what makes me optimistic, is my final remark on this, is that many scientists are aware of this and wanted to change. I've had, since my book came out, I've had approaches from many leading, quite influential scientists uh, who've wanted to talk to me about this. And, because I'm dangerous to know, they, we have these clandestine meetings um, and discuss um, some of these bigger questions. Um, uh, but there's plenty of people in science who want it to change. But uh, they don't dare say so in public. Uh, science is full of closet holists and animists um, and people who've had psychedelic experiences and people who go to alternative practitioners and people who have dogs that know when they're coming home from the laboratory and people who have telepathic experiences. Um, I think they're probably the majority of working scientists and yet they're all in the closet, or nearly all of them. They don't dare come out and tell their colleagues. So one thing that would really change it is something like the gay liberation movement uh, where <laughs> scientists come out of the closet and speak freely and it would look completely different when they do that. And the final point is that Western scientists are now a small minority. Last year, India graduated 2.5 million scientific and engineering graduates, China 1.5 million, the US 500,000, Britain 100,000. And in Britain and America, at the graduate level, a third of those students which were Chinese, Korean, or Indian. So the majority of young scientists today are Asian. They're not European or North American. Uh, and uh, they've bought into this whole culture of science that we've imposed upon them, but it has no relation to their current cultural roots, their cultural traditions. When they're confident enough, they'll break free. And I hope they do that sooner rather than later. But this is something we have to take into account when looking at the big picture of science today. So I think it will change how soon is anyone's guess. But I certainly hope it will happen uh, within the next few years. It's already beginning to happen. Thank you.